Thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed today's service. God is using the ministry of Lakeside to make a difference in many people's lives, and we have heard numerous stories of life change. If God has used the ministry of Lakeside to make a difference in your life, we would love to hear your story. Please email us at amen at lakesidechurch.ca. So over the last five weeks, we have been talking about this whole idea of finding something more than happiness. And we said that because happiness really depends on happenings. What's going on in your world determines whether you're happy or not. We said there's something greater than happiness, and that thing was called joy. This thing is called joy. And in this first part of the letter, which Paul is writing, and he's in prison, and he's facing execution and writing to a church, going through difficult challenges and their own persecution, he could have written about a lot of subjects, but he chose the subject of joy to address in the letter. And he said that there are three things that produce joy. We looked at it in week one. There is this confidence in God that produces joy. There is this perspective that God gives us that produces joy. There are these relationships when we put uh, we ahead of me that bring joy to our world. And it's like he kind of shifts gears and he said, okay, we're not going to talk about what produces joy. We're going to talk about what robs it. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about being stuck in the past, the things of our past, the regrets, the resentments, the pain, the wounds, whatever. He said that can rob us of joy. Last week, we talked about anxiety and how anxiety for many of us, because of fear and worry and all that's an uncertainty that's kind of encapsulated in that word, it can rob us. It can rob us of joy. Well, today, we're going to look at the last of the joy robbers, and the last one is called discontentment. Discontentment is the last of the joy robbers, and I understand discontentment. It is something that has plagued me. It's something that I've struggled with a big part of my life. In fact, you know, I, I've always, you know, when I'm in one job, I'm thinking about another. When I'm, you know, in one car, I'm thinking about another. It's just that I always want something else. And I would even put the word chronic there. It feels a little bit chronic to me at times, this idea of discontentment. And maybe you're like me, or maybe you just have discontentment once in a while, but I think it's one of those plagues that is finding its way into our culture and is grabbing more and more victims. You know, the advertising media continues to remind us just how discontent and dissatisfied we are. They say that if you just had this or you had that, then you would be happier. If you had something different, something more, something better, then life would be better. And they tie it into lifestyle. They tie this idea that you're dissatisfied. If you have this, you will live this lifestyle, right? Right? They say that if you, um, you'd be happier if you've got this or you got that. Or you would be cool if you wear that or drive that. Or you would be um, successful if you can afford this or that, or own this or that, or vacation here. You'll be a somebody if you have these things or those things. And, 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 and who doesn't want to be cool? Who doesn't want to be a somebody? Who doesn't want to be happy? Who doesn't want to be successful? I think that's just a normal thing that we, we long for. And then the advertisers say, yeah, but it's this, different, more, better, that are going to make you feel that way. And for those of you who feel like me, like you're chronically discontent, it's not always a bad thing. See, discontentment's not always a bad thing. I progressed in my journey with Jesus because I haven't been satisfied where I am, and I want to grow deeper, and I want it to be better. And when it comes to obeying God's Word, I, I, I felt like I need to do better. And I think there's a way to do that better, and it was discontentment that led me there. It's discontentment that caused me to leave the marketplace because I looked at the church and I said, I think there's something better out there than the churches that I've experienced, something that was relevant, something that spoke truth, something that was practical, something that allowed us to worship, something that just kind of fit the culture. And it was discontent me that drove me in that and continues to drive me. I mean, the whole thing of a Hope House really came out of my own discontentment with the way people in poverty were treated, because I know how that's like, because I had a season where our family really had very little. And so there is this good side of discontentment, we might call it holy discontentment, but that's not what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the other kind of discontentment that never allows us to feel satisfied with what we have. We're just not satisfied with what, we're ha what we have. But even more for those of you who are Christ followers here today, it is 
you're discontent with what God has given you and what God has provided. Because that's what we believe that God provides and God gives. And when we are discontent, we're discontent with that. We're, we seem to be continually looking elsewhere, thinking and believing that there's something out there that's better, something that's out there that's different, something that will give us more. We all have this it, the, the it, the thing that we think that if we had it, we would be more satisfied. If we had it, we would be more joyful. Do you know what that is? Do you have one of those it's? I mean, we all do, right? And it doesn't matter where you are in the continuum. We all have unhealthy struggles with discontentment from time to times. And we have this it, this it that we seek. I mean, how often have you dreamed of something different, something more, something better, right? I think we think if we've got this elusive it, it would make life easier, it would make life happier, it would solve a whole bunch of problems. I mean, let's be honest. We're all friends here today, right? Let's be honest. How many of you have ever dreamed of winning a lottery? You laugh. Well, I wasn't asking for hands, but thank you for that confession. How many of you have ever dreamed of how you would spend the money? You know, if I won $10 million, $20 million, $25, $60 million, what would I do with the cash? Right? I mean, I dream about you winning the lottery. <laughs> and I, because then I wouldn't have to buy the tickets. And I dream that God would grab your heart and you'd give most of it to Lakeside. <laughs> and that would solve my problems. So we all have dreams of a little more, a little different, a little better. I think we all struggle with subtle shades of discontentment. So let's, let's kind of break this down. What is discontentment? Let's, let's understand it. Well, one, one definition is this. It's a restless, I like that, it's restless, unsettled desires or cravings, could be more than one, for something you don't have. It's just this restless, unsettled desire or craving for something you don't have. Another definition is this. To be dissatisfied with what you have desiring something you think will satisfy the dissatisfaction. That's really what it is. We, we feel dissatisfied and we think there's something out there. There is an it that will satisfy. One writer said this. I love this definition of discontentment, especially of our culture. He said, it's the desire to acquire gone haywire. I think he's true. So, I'm going to put a little bit of a flow chart here because I always say a good message is nothing without a picture. So I'm going to put a little flow chart to kind of walk us through this sort of process of discontentment. So we're going to put discontentment on the top. I'll just put the word discontent because... And it affects our heart. And we, we start off and we have this little heart of discontentment. And it kind of breathes there because of whatever and it kind of sits there and, you know, but it's not really active. We just kind of feel it. It's the feeling. But what happens is that it gets fueled by four things. The first thing it gets fueled by is comparing. So I look at my neighbor, I look at my siblings, I look at my friends, I look at my coworkers, and I say, they've got a little more than I do in whatever area that we feel our discontentment. And I want to have what they have. And so we compare and it begins to fuel it. So that's the one thing. The second thing that fuels it is this word, and it's similar, but it's different. And that is com comp competition, right? And so comparing is, want, is wanting what they have. Competition is wanting more than they have. I want to have more than somebody else. And so I look at what they have and I go, I want to be a little bit more than that. And then they look at you and go, oh, I want that too, right? So we just kind of play the cycle in, sometimes in relationships. So it can be comparing, it can be competition. The third thing and this, is, this one is the one I think I battle with and why it's chronic. It's an issue of character, and it's a, it's a character, uh, character brokenness. And for, for many, and I think I suffer from this, it's, it's insecurity, it's a lack of positive self-worth, it's that idea that I don't measure up. And so if I had this or had more or wore this or drove this or lived there or whatever, people would think I'm a somebody. And who doesn't want to feel that way? And I know it's out of that sort of self-worth and insecurity that I kind of want those things. The last one is the plague of our culture 
when it comes to discontentment and its entitlement. And people will say, well, entitlement is simply, I want what I think I deserve. That's not entitlement. That's part of it. I think I deserve it, and I want it. But true entitlement is these words. I think I deserve it, and I want it, and then we add one little three-letter word at the end. Now. Entitlement is, I don't have to wait, I don't have to save, I don't have to do whatever, I just get it now because I deserve it. And so we have discontentment, it affects our heart, and we fuel it with these four, these four things, and it leads to another condition. And this is the condition the Bible talks about, and it's covetousness. Covetousness. The Bible talks a lot about this. So this is your heart discontent. When you fuel it, your heart is like this. It's much bigger. And covetousness is an issue of the heart. It's an issue of the heart. In fact, it's so important, an issue, that when God was saying, I'm putting the top ten list together of things I don't want people to do because it will wreck their lives, called the Ten Commandments, covetousness was included in the top ten. And it says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17, it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife or husband or his male or female servant. I don't know, we don't have an equivalent to that today, at least not in this country. And so let's just say that, you know, that's, you know, his gardener or his landscaper. Or we covet, you not to covet his ox or his donkey. That's his mode of transportation. A little different today. And then he says these last words. Anything that belongs to your neighbor, do not covet. Anything that belongs to somebody else, that, you di that you're discontent with what you have, and you've run it through this fueling, and now you feel this. Because it's a real problem. Because it's what captures our heart. And it's not long when our heart is beating fast for those it's that we want, that we step over a line and get what we want, and we don't really think about the consequences. It's covetousness that leads to action. So let's just talk about what covetousness is. And there are four things I think it is. Number one, it's wanting the wrong things. So you're in a marriage relationship and you're not happy, and you're pretty dissatisfied, and you're pretty discontent, and you start to pursue a relationship with somebody else that's not your spouse, and you end up having that affair, that is wanting the wrong things. So that's part of covetousness. It's wanting the wrong things. Your neighbor's wife is the wrong thing. The second is wanting the right things for the wrong reasons. As I said here, sometimes we want things and sometimes we want these issues so we can build our image up so people will think we're somebody. So they're not bad things that we want, but we're doing it for the wrong reasons. The third one is wanting the right things at the wrong time. So God's plan was that we, as men and women together, would enjoy sexuality, intimacy together. But God's plan also was that it's going to be within the framework of marriage. So it's a right thing that God has created, but we want it at the wrong time. We want it outside of that framework. The last one is wanting the right things, but the wrong amount. Now, let's just use money. Nothing wrong with money. You have to have money. We live in a culture where, that, where currency is critical, right? Nothing wrong with it. It's when we want it in the wrong amount. We want, you know, the 25, 50, 100 million dollar payoff. It's wanting the wrong amount. That's what covetousness is. And what happens is, is that we go, we get discontent, we fuel it, we create this sinful choices called covetousness, and things flow out from that. It's that thinking that something different, more or better, is going to make me happy. And whether we'd like to admit it or not, all of us, to a small degree, believe that money would bring happiness. Maybe not joy, but it would bring happiness. And our culture has bought into the thinking that happiness is found in all that we have, and there are books being written and researched to prove it. We see it in our culture, don't we? You've, it's observable. But we see it sometimes in our own lives. If I only had whatever the blank is, if I only had this, then I'd be happy. We all have that blank in our minds. We all have an it that fills that blank. What is your it? 
See, we've all heard stories or read about stories of people who pursued the it as far as they could take it. They got to the top of the more ladder. They had more than anybody else. And at the top of the ladder, they discovered that they were not any happier than before they started to climb. And some of them became addicts to drugs and alcohol because they were disillusioned. Some so disillusioned they took their own lives. Others were distant and broke many of the relationships they were involved in. Others wrecked another area of their lives, maybe their vocational area, all because this played out and they got to the top and they were so deeply dissatisfied. You see, these, this thing, covetousness, discontentment at the start, it has downsides. Let me share a couple of them. There are four of them, actually. First one is this. It's a rejection of God's provision and sufficiency. It's when you say, I want more and more. I, I continue to want more of this or more of that. You are saying to God, what you have provided for me, and I know you promised to provide my needs, but what you have provided, it isn't enough. You're holding out on me. You're not taking care of me. I have needs and expectations, and you're not meeting those expectations. You don't think it that way, but when you get discontent and it turns to covetousness, you are rejection, rejecting that God has provided whatever you have. Whether it's a lot or a little, God has provided it. And you believe He's not doing a great job. And so it's a rejection of that. Secondly, it's a competing rival to God. It is a competing rival to God. You see, when we turn what we want, whatever those desires are, we, we, we can turn them into an idol and we can worship them. And they get priority and attention and focus, and it's what we start to think about most often, and it's what we use our gifts to pursue. An idol by traditional definition is anything that takes the place of God in our lives. I think there's a better definition than that. I think it's when I look to something that does not have God's power to give me what only God's power can give me. And so when I look at something else to give me security or stability or joy or peace or whatever, I'm making it an idol because only God can ultimately give me those things. And we take good things like success, career, love, material possessions, even family, and we turn them, we look to them for security and stability and joy and peace. They aren't going to give it to us. Only God can. You know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you can't serve God or money. Actually, he didn't use the word money. We've translated it that way. It's the word mammon, and the word, uh, mammon was the god of materialism and encompassed the idea of possession, earnings, gains, riches, and money. And Jesus said, you can't do both. And why? Because it's an issue of the heart. And he says that you'll love one and hate the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. But you can't do it. It's impossible because they're rivals. You worship one or the other. So I want to prove my point today. So here's what I want you to do. I'll do it too. If you have a wallet or a change purse or whatever you keep your money and credit cards in, just go ahead and grab it if it's easy to grab. Just go ahead and do it right now. We'll just, you know, do a little Jeopardy moment and wait. So grab whatever you put your money in. Um, maybe a money clip. Might be your pants pocket. Whatever. So what you are holding in your hands now is the temple of the 21st century. It's what it is. It really is. It's the God mammon. And sometimes we want to worship at the temple. We want to, you know, hold it in our hand. But the big question is, are you holding it or is it holding you? Ever thought about that? Is it you holding it or is it holding you? So if you've done that and you've got it in your hand, here's what I want you to do. Hand it to the person next to you. Now you're getting nervous and sweat is beginning to flow. Right? Because we get a little bit nervous when we release it and give it to somebody else. So if you've done that now, we're taking up an offering and you can give as generously as you've ever wanted in the past. That'll be cheaper. Here you go, Simon. First time people have thrown things in a long time. Um, <laughs> So that's the deal, right? Now, make sure, you, have you given the wallets back? Like, come on, it's time. Like, like give them back. But see how that feels? Because that's kind of how it is. It's kind of how it is. And, 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 and it can be a rival God. The third thing is that it determines our priorities and focus. It just does. That it, when it gets to here, where it's at the bottom of your heart, when it's like here and your heart's getting big because of it, that it. 
that it grabs your attention and that matters more than anything else. You see, we all have these imaginary trophies in life, don't we? And that at the end will be on display. And on one side of the, there are the trophies of money and success and stuff and pleasure. Those are trophies. And on the other side are relationships with God and with others. And the sad thing is, is a lot of people are going to get to the end and they're going to have these large trophies of money and success and power and all of those things, big homes, big cars, blah, 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 blah. they're going to have it all. And they're going to look to the trophy of relationship because it's the one that matters the most near the end. And it's going to be either non-existent or very, very small. And these trophies will lose their luster. See, here's the reality. Some people will say, well, I'm building these trophies for this season of life. And when that sort of gets done and I get them on the shelf, then I'll build the relational trophy. The problem is, is damage is often done that's irreparable or you die and never get the chance. I believe that these myths can have a stronghold and I believe that the root of the increased brokenness of millennials and busters, those 20 to 45 today, are mums and dads who got bit by the more monster and affected their priorities and focus and left wounds and hurts and scars and loneliness on their kids. And it happened subtly, subtly and nobody saw it coming. I just think it's one of the big pieces. I think it's one of the big chunks. Here's the last one. And this is like, you know this to be true. They don't last. They don't satisfy very long. And they don't provide security. They just don't. You know, we're sold these empty promises by our culture that these things can give us significance, fulfillment, security, and joy. That's a joke because they don't. We think if I own this, I'll feel worthy. If I achieve this, I'll feel significant. If I have this, I'll be happy. If I make a little more money, I'll be satisfied. If I get the promotion, I'll feel valued. If I get more money, I'll be satisfied and feel secure. The person that I want to love, I want, you know, if I can get them, then I'll feel secure. But we discover the heartbreaking truth so much, so eventually, don't we? <laughs> that it's never enough. And we can sac sacrifice everything for these desires, and they leave us longing and waiting and wounded and empty. Unfortunately, that doesn't stop some of us from trying. And the reason that we're not fully satisfied, you ever wonder why they don't? is because you were not designed for them to satisfy. You were designed for only one thing to satisfy your soul, the heartbeat of who you are, the core of your being, and that's a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That was the only thing that will satisfy your soul. And so ultimately, if you're chasing something else, it won't if you haven't chased that one. Because that's what satisfies. And one of the richest guys and the wisest guys that ever lived was named Solomon. And he, he, he did not feel satisfied in his soul. I think he was a chronic discontented person when I read his story. And he went on this search and he took it farther than any of us could because he had more money than any of us have. And he sought after, you know, things like money and education and pleasure and power and possessions and achievement and sex and all those things. And at the end of the day, you know what he said? Well, one word. Anybody know what that word was? Meaningless. Empty means empty. Look what he says at the end of the experiment. Now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Here is what will satisfy your soul. Fear God. That's a relationship with God based on respect and reverence. Fear God and keep his commandments. Follow him fully. It says, fear God, follow him fully. This is your responsibility. This is what will satisfy your soul. You see, your heart and my heart were created to be satisfied by a relationship with Jesus and following Him. And if something else takes that, then that gets pushed aside. And you know, maybe you're a spiritual explorer or a cynic here today, and you're saying, I don't know if what I believe in and what I believe in, but I know what you're talking about. I felt that little subtle ache. I felt that subtle emptiness. I think, mm, I, it feels like there's something more out there. It's so subtle. And maybe you've tried to satisfy it by seeking the wrong things, but that hasn't worked. Because the only thing you are shaped to be satisfied with in the soul is a relationship with God. And so we're all there on the continuum of discontentment, and it affects our joy. Some in our culture have turned coveting into an art form, and there's books being written on it today. Well, the writer Paul comes along, and he says, there's an alternative. And this is what he says. 
I rejoice, again, he's talking about joy. I rejoice greatly where? In the Lord. That's where joy comes from. That at last you've renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. So, in other words, he's saying, oh, I'm so glad you've, you've got concern for me, and you've sent some gifts, and you've sent some money, and you've sent some clothes, and you've sent some food. Thank you very much. It's kind of this thank you, but then it's kind of like, he says these next lines, I'm not saying this because I needed it. In other words, thanks for your gift, but I didn't really need it. Right? That's what he's saying. Thanks for the gift. I didn't need it. Why? Because I have learned. He's learned. What? To be content. See, contentment is something we learn. It doesn't come instantaneously. You don't wake up one morning and pray the night before and say, Lord, make me content, and you wake up, and that's where you are, because it's a learned activity. I know this to be true because I've had children, and now I have grandchildren. And I know that, you know, the first words they speak are more and mine long before they ever say, oh, enough. <laughs> right? It's true. Some of them grow up never saying enough. Right? And so we know that it's in our character, it's part of who we are, and it takes time to learn it. And then he says this, I, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances, whatever's going on in my life, I figured this thing out. So contentment produces joy because it's not dependent on happenings is what he says. He says, I know what it is to be in need. That word could be translated poverty. I know what it's like to live in poverty, and I know what it's like to have plenty. I know poverty. I know plenty. I have learned. I've learned. He's saying, again, it's a learned activity. What? The secret. It's a secret. Now, the word secret there is, is, is more like the word mystery, or it's more like it's something I just can't understand, or it's hard to understand. I've learned that which is hard to understand when it comes to being content in any and every situation. Contentment is it, it, it bypasses wherever things are at, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether I'm living in plenty or in poverty. And then he says, oh, and now I'm going to give you the secret. Now, this is a verse that often gets used for so many things, and it has a broader use, but its pure context is in contentment. The secret to contentment is, I can do everything through Him, through Christ, who gives me strength. I can I can deal with this because Christ is my strength. Christ provides the strength. Christ is my strength. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. In other words, thanks again, but I'm already content because I have this secret, and it's Christ. And what Paul is really saying is this. Joy is not found in more. Joy is found in contentment. Joy is not found in the more we have or what, getting the it. It's found in being content. And here's a definition of contentment. It's the satisfaction with God's sufficient provision. It's the satisfaction of God's significant provision, sufficient… Pres and he's just saying, see, I know God has provided for my needs. I know that because I can do all things through Christ. It's, it's, it's God provides, and I'm satisfied with what God provides. Sometimes it won't be a lot, he says. Okay, God knows. Not a lot right now. Sometimes it'll be a lot. God knows when it can be a lot. Sometimes I'm going to feel hungry and go without some of those basics for a bit. Other times I'm going to have plenty. He's saying it doesn't matter. God is in, he's in all of this. He's in all of this. And so I rest in the reality that God has given me what He wants when He wants me to have it. There's this real sense of deep-seated adequacy in God. One writer said this. I love this, this quote. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. That's powerful. And Paul says, I have that. I have that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit because I've said, God's given me what God wants me to have. No matter what, God's in the business of providing. And then Paul kind of goes on, and he doesn't say much more about it here. He doesn't say a whole lot more about the secret. But he writes another letter to another group of people. They're not going through as difficult circumstances as this, but they are going through challenging times. And it's found in 1 Timothy. He writes to a person who's the pastor of a church, Timothy. 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. And so I'm just going to look at these two passages, and real briefly, like we're just going to bank shot through these, some keys to finding the secret of contentment. So here's the first one, and it kind of fits to just what we just have right here. Look to Jesus for your sufficiency. 
Right? That's what he said. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. It's concluding that all that I have, God knows that I need. Because he knows what I need and he's promised to provide it. Sometimes it'll be a lot, sometimes it won't. But this is all about trust and reliance on God to meet my needs. I believe God will. I know he will. He's promised. He's good to his promise. Therefore, I'm going to wait. Therefore, I'm going to rely. Therefore, I'm going to find my contentment in his provision. It's an issue of trust. Contentment is an issue of how much do I trust God. Too often, discontent speaks to our thinking. Oh, God hasn't supplied your needs. You need, you need to do whatever to get those needs met. Or God is holding out, of you, out on you. Grab hold of what you want. Or you need something more than you have, and you're, it's, it's going to be up to you to get it. And it moves us from God's sufficiency to self-sufficiency, believing that we know better than God what we need in the season. We know better. And it comes down to the depth of our trust you realize contentment is an issue of trust, believing that our security is in God. He will provide for our needs. He knows what we need, and it's trusting and waiting and relying, and it takes surrender, and it takes humility, and it's not easy because sometimes He doesn't give us much. You see, we think, though, those are the only people who are discontent who don't have much. Mm, Paul says that. You can be discontent in having a lot, because it's just about wanting more. It doesn't matter where you are or what you have. You can want more. And so he says that it's a trust in God. The second thing he says is find contentment and discontentment for the right things. So he says, I want you to be content, but I want you to be discontent. And this is the verse, 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So he talks about godliness. And godliness is that relationship that we have with God. It's foundational. The relationship we have with Jesus. It's about saying, I'm not content with my relationship. I want it deeper. I want it better. I want it fuller. Or I'm not content with the way I'm living according to what God wants me to live. I could do better. So I'm, I'm, I'm not content with that, and I keep pressing on. I'm not content with an issue of injustice that I see, and my discontentment will make me do something about it. I'm not content with something that God wants me to be discontent with. I'm not content, so therefore I'm going to grow in that, and that's what godliness. We need that holy discontent, but we also need to have contentment. And he says when you have the holy discontentment plus you are content with what you have. This is about who you are. This is about what you have. He says it's real success. It's great gain. It's great gain. See, godliness plus contentment is the success, not godliness and prosperity or godliness and power and influence or godliness and, and the right relationships or godliness and anything else. No, we're, the formula for real gain or real success is godliness, discontent about that, but contentment with what we have. The next thing he says here is to, well, there's this formula. He says, remember, everything earthly is terminal. Everything earthly is terminal. This is what he says. For we brought nothing into this world, and we take nothing out. And that's so true. Everything earthly has an end point. All of our stuff wears out, gets outdated, or falls apart. It has an end point. And so do we. And you don't take anything with you. Everything has an end point. It's end point or your end point. But there's an end point. And for 11 years, I worked in the funeral business. And we would have families come in, and if it was a male family member that died, they'd bring a suit and a shirt and tie, and we would dress them. But some families would come in and say, well, we don't have a very good suit at all. So for sale, we had suits that were made specifically for someone who had died. And, um, and then we would sell them, and, and we, put them, we would use those. Well, one day I was working, and I slopped stuff all over me. Uh, I won't tell you what that is, but I, I did. And I thought, what am I going to do? I have a, an appointment coming up, and I don't have a suit. What am I going to do? I thought, aha, I know what I'll do. So I went and grabbed one of those boxes with the suit, right? I put the shirt on, and it, it, it had ties in the back to make it tight, and put the tie on, and put the pants on, and there's little ties, elastic waist. They look really fashionable. And, um, and I put the jacket on, and here's what I noticed. I had all the… I thought, I look okay. I'll get through the day. First thing I did is try to reach in my pocket. There wasn't any. They looked like there were, but there were no pockets on the inside, and there were no pockets to the pants, and there were no pockets at the back. And here's what I realized. When you die, there's no pockets because you can't take it with you. 
We leave pocketless. And that's the truth. That's the truth. We, when we make madly pursuing earthly things, we leave them here because they have an end point. We have an end point. Here's the deal. The only thing that's transferable from this life to the life that comes is the relational trophies. People whose lives we built into and cared for and loved. It's the only thing you take with you. The next thing he says. He says, let enough be enough. Let enough be enough. This is what he says. But if we have food or clothing. Now this word clothing could be the word covering. So it could be clothing that covers you or it could be your shelter, your, your place of residence. So he says, if we have food, clothing, and a place of residence, we'll be content with that. It's determining when our needs are met that that's enough, that that's enough. Everything beyond that is a want, and it's admitting it. Okay, I have enough. That is a want. Just call it for what it is. And he talks, you know, I, I think the thing here is that we all need to have food, right? So if we have food, and most of us have a fridge full or a pantry full of it, if we have clothing to cover us. Well, I know most of us here have more than one item of clothing. He says shelter. I think most of us here have a dry roof over our heads. And I think he would add, in this culture, reliable transportation. I think most of us have those things. And he's saying, when you have that, that's enough. He says, at some point, you've got to go, okay, enough is enough, and I'll draw a line in the sand. And so many people do that. And they get what they think is enough, but they feel the more monster biting. So they rub out the line and say, I'm going to move the line over here. And we keep moving the line. And he's saying, no, no, don't keep doing that. No, when enough is enough. And I love this. I love this next verse. It says this, command those who are rich. This is all of us here today based on what he meant by those who are rich. In this present world, not to be arrogant or put your hope in wealth. So many people do, right? And it comes crashing down because it's uncertain. But put your hope where? Hope in God who what? Richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. See, God's not a cheapskate. God's not a miser. God is not withholding. He richly provides you with everything for your enjoyment. And you just say, well, what I have, I am not enjoying. The problem is not God's, it's yours, because He's already given you everything you need to enjoy life. Contentment is found. Contentment is found not in the size of our bank account, but in the condition of our heart. It's all about the heart. It matters what captures our heart. And this kind of moves on. This next one, I'm just going to put the verse up and read it. it. It's enough. Be reminded of the destructive nature of contentment. There is a downside. There is a destructive nature, and people have faced it and experienced it. Here's what he says. People who want to get rich, they want more. They fall into temptation. I don't know how many people have crossed lines of temptation on the, because they wanted something different, something more, something better. And there's a trap. I think he's probably talking about debt that trap. We feel trapped by it. And it says that they fall into foolish and harmful desires. And, and, and there's these desires that they, they seek after, and they're foolish. And that, you know what the word foolish means? Without God. They're desires that God's not part of, and they're harmful. And he says, and because of the temptation, because of the trap, and because of the desires, it plunges men. The word plunge is a sinking of a ship. Or it could be that with a toilet. They didn't have that in mind in that day. But you get plunged into ruin and destruction. That, I don't need to describe. We just know what that could be like. And it says this, because it's an issue of the heart. The love of money, not money. Money is not the root of all kinds of evil. It's when we love it. It's when our heart loves it. Some people eager for money, for things, for more, for better, have what wandered from faith. God become more distant and they've pierced themselves. This is the idea of stabbing yourself with a knife in your hand. They've pierced themselves with many griefs, not just one grief, but many. There's a downside. Don't be deceived. It's like the swimmer in the ocean where you go out and you're unaware and you underestimate the undertow, right? And that's what discontentment's like. And it's often seen, it's not often seen on the surface, but you get caught up it and you get pulled out and pulled out, and eventually you feel like you're going to drown. 
many, many underestimate the ripple effects of discontentment until they're pulled out to sea and there's nothing they can do. But here's the deal. If you feel like you're drowning today, there's a lifeguard and his name's Jesus, and he will rescue you if you cry out to him. And he will say, okay, but you've got to do it my way because you can't fight me as I pull you back to shore. And he'll pull you back to shore, and he'll return you to safety. So what is it that you desire today? What's that it? And what might it cost you to pursue it. And then the last one, it's like a, we're going to talk more about this next week because he continues this and I needed to break it up into two messages to have enough time. But it's about focusing outwardly, not inwardly. It's focusing on uh, the needs of others more than you focus on, on you. It's getting your eyes off of the me and onto the we. That's what he's kind of talking about. And this is the verse. He says, command them to do good. The them is those who want to be rich. Command them to do good, to be rich where? In good deeds and to be generous and share. So he's just saying an outward focus. Because when you do that, when you have that outward focus, you're going to lay up a treasure for yourself as a firm foundation for the coming age. He says, if you focus on the right thing, good deeds, being generous, sharing with others, making a difference, looking outward. You're going to build some treasures that are going to… You can't take certain treasures with you, but these are treasures that will be there waiting for you. And then he says, and in this life, that you may take hold of the life that's truly life. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want a life that is truly living? We all do. And so that's the secret. It's that simple. Those are hard things to do. This is a battle. Oh, this is a battle. There's nothing easy about fighting discontentment. Nothing easy about it. But this is the battle, and this is the secret. And I just want to close today just asking you one question. Is there an area of your life where you would like to become more content with what you have? Is there? Is there something that you just need to be more content about? What's the discontentment? Watch it that it doesn't go and get fueled and become covetousness and grab your heart. But that's the question. Is there anything today? You say, oh, in this area of my life, I want to be more content. Name it. And then pray about it. And ask God to take hold of it. Let's pray. So, Father God, this morning, thank you. I think the greatest truth that we could walk away from this today is when it comes to discontentment and contentment, it's that one verse, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And may we rely on your sufficiency and your power and your strength. And may we see your generous hand in our lives. May we share with gratitude for the things you've done. And may we find that contentment that brings joy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We were pressed on every side Full of fear and troubled thoughts For good reason we carried heavy hearts It is good
Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this message. To hear it again or other messages, please visit us at lakesidechurch.ca.